The following podcast is part of the Underdog Sports Podcast Network. For advertising information or to find more great podcasts, visit us at www.theunderdogsports.com and follow us on Twitter at RealTheUnderdog. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Atlantic Files, brought to you by BasketballSocietyOnline.com and the Underdog Sports Podcast Network, the number one podcast on the number one division in the NBA, brought to you by your host, myself, Alex Fishbein. So, if you guys were here with us last week, you would know that we did a Western Conference preview. So, of course, this week, with one week before the season starts, we have to go with the Eastern Conference preview. Now, usually, you know, we do uh, divisional uh, previews for every episode, but this time we decided to break it down by conference because, um, you know, with the the season extending all the way until... Um, like September, October last year, and then this new season only starting a few months later, there wasn't as much time in between to really do a preview with everything else going on with free agency and the drafts and everything kind of getting crammed in there. So without further ado, let's jump into this Eastern Conference preview. I did not mean to make any of those rhyme. Um, so we're going to start off with the Southeast Division. So last year's standings. We have the Miami Heat, who are in first at 44 and 29, Orlando Magic in second, Hornets in third, Wizards in fourth, Hawks in fifth. Now, we know that the Miami Heat eventually ended up making the finals in the bubble. Um, their team chemistry looked second to none, other than maybe the Lakers, who ended up winning the finals. But uh, Jimmy Butler came down there amidst all of the, you know, the rumors and the the backlash of him not being a great teammate. But when he came to Miami, he looked like probably one of the best teammates ever and hyped up his his guys like his rookies and even the vets on top of it, uh, you know, hyped up the younger guys like Bam. Um, he really seemed like he brought the team together. He seemed like he was a glue guy pretty much. So uh, the the team chemistry looked amazing. It still looks amazing now because they have a lot of the same guys returning. Um, in the off season, uh, they did draft Precious Ashwa. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I'm sorry if I butchered it. I probably did, but uh, they drafted Precious. They signed Avery Bradley. They lost Crowder. Um, uh, they gave Bam the max extension. They signed Dragic to a two-year extension. Al Alinek picked up his option. And the last was Udonis Haslam is back again, which is awesome for the Miami Heat culture. Obviously, he's not really playing all that much. He probably, uh, this re-signing probably won't mean that he's going to get more playing time, especially now that he's 40. Uh, but I think it's just great for the culture, great for the team chemistry, amazing for the bench, and for the younger guys to keep learning about you know, being in the league, you know, all the behind the scenes stuff. It's just great for the culture all around. Um, really, with the Miami Heat, I see a lot of the same things still happening with this team. I think that, you know, with the defensiveness of the the team's identity, uh, the offensive side is going to continue to get better, especially because in the playoffs, we didn't really even get to see Dragic uh, in the finals. And, and Dragic was one of their leading scorers in the playoffs before he got hurt. So there's a lot of this team's offense that we still get to see. And, uh, I mean, another year of growth for a guy like Tyler Hero, another year of growth for Bam. Um, oh, and they also grabbed Mo Harkless, who is another great defensive uh, asset to have, another guy that can also hit the three. And you get another year of experience for Duncan Robinson on top of all of that, their number one shooter on the team. So there's a lot of things to like about the Miami Heat. Spolstra, obviously a good coach on top of that, and they have been able to develop a lot of talent. So they'll be one to watch next season. So moving on to Orlando, who was second last year. They're still pretty much a middling team. They're still not that great of a team. They're, I guess you can say they are a playoff contender. They're just barely scraping into playoffs a lot. Um, but they're nowhere close to a true championship contender. They're nowhere close to one of the top teams in the East. Um, and 
to me, after this offseason that they had, they're just going to continue to look the same as well. They did draft Cole Anthony. I thought that was a very good pick, um, especially because they still don't exactly know what's going on with Markel Fultz just yet. And they also signed Dwayne Bacon. Um, Bacon, you know, was a big time scorer in the G League. I think he put up like 31 points per game in the G League when he was with the Charlotte Hornets G League affiliate. Um, but we have yet to really see him take off, you know, in the NBA. And I think that Orlando will present him at least an opportunity to do that, especially because, so they lost, um, Augustine, Awundu, Frazier, and B BJ Johnson. Um, with the, with the departure of Awundu, I think that opens up a spot for Dwayne Bacon. And I think he'll have the chance to show what he's got to actually prove if he belongs in the league or not. I think that he at least is deserved, deserved, he's at least earned, we'll just go with earned, <laughs> he's at least earned a rotational player position, you know, a role player from the bench, I think. I think that's something he could definitely thrive in and someone for like or with like Orlando, they could definitely use his services, especially on offense. Cole Anthony, I think, will eventually become their starting point guard, to be honest with you, if he's not going to be already. Uh, Markel Fultz, the growth of Fultz is going to be something that's very, very, very important for Orlando this season. So I think that's one of the biggest things to watch for for this team coming up is Will Fultz take that next step? Will he get closer to what he was projected or expected to be? And if he can even get close to what he was, what was expected of him in the first place, that is a humongous win for Orlando because they really didn't get rid of much to get him in the first place from Philly. And that gives you another starting guard along with Cole Anthony uh, for the future. I mean, um, Fultz is still young. I think he's like 21. So, you still have a lot of room with Fultz left. There's still a lot to go with him. Cole Anthony, also very young, very talented. And another thing is, I think this season we're going to really determine if Mo Bamba is a bust or not. He hasn't been great. They haven't been able to really put him as their starting you know, power forward or center as they probably hoped to do. And even as a backup, really not delivering efficient or... I've either like effective minutes. Uh, that's going to be something I think that is going to be a another storyline to kind of follow. And another thing is, can Jonathan Isaac stay healthy? He's looked good when he has stayed healthy. He he did put up 11.9 points, 6.8 rebounds, 1.4 assists, 1.6 steals, and 2.3 blocks a game before he got hurt last season. He looked like a big part of this team and looked like he could be a very big contributor, but I think that's something that you're going to have to monitor the whole time because at this point, you can give him the injury-prone tag. I think that it's deserved deservedly so uh, of of giving that to him with the amount of injury issues he has had and not just that but severe injuries they're not just like minor ones they're ones that are taking him out like the rest of the season so um that's going to be a thing to look for and then the other thing is Aaron Gordon so at one point it looked like he was taking a step in his shooting then last season he shoots 30 percent from three and I think it was like 42 or 43 percent from the floor um really didn't give you a whole lot in terms of like, you know, he's really supposed to be one of your all-star players on this team other than Vucevic. And he's really not giving you the kind of production that you would want from that. So I think that that's a, a thing to look for. He honestly could be trade bait at some point, maybe later on in the season or next season, but I mean, they did sign him to a decent bit of money, so I don't know if anyone would really be willing to take on that contract for what he produces. Then we move on to the Charlotte Hornets, who are on the rise. They had a very solid draft class. They had they drafted LaMelo Ball, Vernon Carey, Nick Richards, Grant Riller. Obviously, the biggest one of those being LaMelo Ball, but I think the next best guy that will probably give you some production is either Vernon Carey or Grant Riller. Um, no disrespect to Nick Richards, by the way. Um, they did a sign and trade for Gordon Hayward. They paid him $120 million over four years. Still don't know about all that. 
Um, and they lost Dwayne Bacon, Willie Hernan Gomez, uh, Batum, Kobe Simmons, and Ray Spaulding. In terms of the talent that they lost, it's not much talent that they lost. Um, really, not many of those guys were even playing. Batum was hurt a lot. They paid Batum a crap ton of money, but they finally got him out of there. I think they stretched his contract, which... When people do that, I don't. I'm like, I'm not a huge fan of it. You still have teams paying guys that really weren't all that good when they were at the team for years and years and years to come, and sometimes it comes back to bite you. So I'm not really a fan of it, but it is what it is. Especially, I'm not really a fan of it after you do that and then sign a guy like Gordon Hayward to a hundred twenty million dollar contract. But hey, it's Michael Jordan's team. You know, you do you do what you want. I'll just sip that tea or that coffee in this case. Um, so big things to look for. We want to see what LaMelo Ball is like. Is LaMelo Ball coming in as advertised? I mean, so far in the preseason, his his, distri uh, 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 woo, his dis distribution abilities <laughs> have looked outstanding. I mean, it also looks like his the, sh the way he shares the ball – is infectious with the rest of the team because it looked like the team was just moving the ball like really quickly, touch passes all over the place, finding the right guy, making the right pass, making the right play, and it looked like it's really rubbing off on the rest of the team. And if that's the case, that's going to be huge for Charlotte, um, you know, in the long run as well as just this season. The other thing is they already have some solid guys in place, and we need to see what kind of growth we're going to get out of them. We have Terry Rozier, Devontae Graham, uh, Miles Bridges, Malik Monk. Now, Graham definitely should have been most improved player of the year last year. We need to see what kind of uh, next step he's going to make this year. Also, with Bridges and Monk, we need to see what kind of steps those two are making. Can Monk be, you know, like the shooter and like the all-around wing that they wanted? Um, can Bridges be like a night in, night out, you know, energy, defensive, throwdown, athletic slasher that they need more often than not? Um, right now, Gordon Hayward is technically the best player on the team. Is Gordon Hayward going to return to his Utah Jazz level of play? Because in the Celtics, yes, he took a back seat to guys like Tatum and Brown because he wanted, well, I don't know if he wanted to, like, um, uh, watch them grow, but you know, the Celtics did. Uh, but ever since his injury, he didn't, he just hasn't looked like the same player in general. So he did want an expanded role. Uh, right now it's up to him to actually do something with it. Um, and again, he needs to stay healthy in the first place. And also I just really want to see, will the mellow ball be able to make others better through the ball movement? Now, usually we talk about veterans making younger guys better or veterans making, you know, some of the role players better with their leadership and, and even their distribution skills and stuff like that. But I think the mellow ball has the potential to do that with players on this team even as a rookie because of how young some of these guys are on the team but also because a lot of this team is not used to playing like a very highly distributive uh style of play we've uh, we've seen that the hornets a lot play especially when Kemba was there a lot of iso a lot of things like that so i'm curious to see if that will be contagious the whole season not just in the preseason that we've seen so far and now we move on to the Wizards, who moved on from John Wall, the face of the Wizards for such a long time, it feels like. He has finally moved. Uh, he is now on to Houston. Um, and now we have Russell Westbrook and Bradley Beal, which I think this this duo, the, the, the dynamic between the two, um, I think will kind of go very similar to how it was with Wall and Beal. I mean... Westbrook still gets you like anywhere from like eight to 10 to 11 assists per game. He gets you those triple doubles. Um, he can, I mean, he can essentially do everything John Wall can do. And that both of their three point shooting isn't the best. I think you can maybe say, I haven't looked at the percentages in a while, but you can maybe say Walls is a tiny bit better. But when you have a guy like Beal, you don't need to really. Um, 
and I mean, they have other shooters on top of that. So um, I think that's going to be an interesting storyline to see. Will Westbrook be able to do with Washington what John Wall couldn't do? I mean, at this stage of the game in there, like, I don't want to say they're old because they're not old, but like Westbrook's not, you know, doing all of the crazy stuff he was doing before, like when he first was on uh, Oklahoma City. So they drafted Danny Avija and Cassius Winston, two solid draft picks. I think that those are guys that Avija will probably crack the starting lineup at some point, whereas Winston will probably be a good bench player. Uh, prospect for them. I think he'll be a good backup to somebody like Russell Westbrook. Um, they added Robin Lopez and Howell Neto in free agency. Neto will probably take over those backup point guard um, duties until maybe Cassius Winston, if they feel comfortable giving it to him. Robin Lopez is good to shore up the front court as well after guys like Thomas Bryant and Rui Hachimura. I mean, you still need some depth there to, to have guys coming in. Um, they lost Napier, Gary Payton II, uh, Ian Mahimi, Uthoff, and Jerry and Grant. That list of people that they lost, again, nothing really going on there for me to say, like, oh, they lost a lot. And then when they lost Wall, they still gained Westbrook, which I think to me is kind of a even deal there, especially. I mean, it could even just be better for Washington because Wall hasn't even played in two seasons, and we don't know if Wall's going to – make this entire season healthy. So that's also a thing to look out for. Um, I think they're a potential eighth seed just due to Westbrook and Beal. We talk about the East not being very strong, but I think the East got stronger this season, um, especially because now with the Brooklyn Nets, who are fourth in their own division and barely made the playoffs, just returned Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. That shoots them up the standings, and the rest of the Eastern teams are still as strong as they were before. I mean, the Bucks arguably getting stronger. So there's a lot of teams now in the East that have gotten better, so I think that this kind of makes them around an eighth seed. Um, and then we're moving on. Oh, no, sorry. Actually, we also want to see the growth of Rui Hachimura and the health of Bertans. Uh, those those two things will definitely be key. I think Rui Achimura has shown that he definitely uh, belongs in the league, but we need to see that next step now. And then Bertans, as long as he's healthy, they signed him to a good uh, longer contract, and he has to show that he's going to be like the, you know, their number one perimeter threat. I mean, I guess outside of Beal. And then. Finally, for this division, we move on to the Atlanta Hawks. They make a huge splash in the offseason. They probably have one of the best offseasons in the league, if not the best. And they drafted Onyeko Kongwu, a very nice inside threat, uh, power forward center for them. Skylar Mays, a, uh, a smaller scoring guard. And then through free agency and trades, they added Gallinari. They added Bogdan Bogdanovich. They added Rondo, Chris Dunn, Solomon Hill and Tony Snell. The only guys that they ended up losing were Bembry, Teague, uh, Travion Graham, Charlie Brown, Deadman, and Vince Carter. Again, the guys they are losing do not outweigh what they are bringing in, so big props to the Hawks on that one. All of these moves, I think, will shift the attention now to Trey Young, John Collins, and Coach Lloyd Pierce, because now you have a lot of quality pieces on the team along with your two young stars and you need to make it work. I mean, I personally, I don't know if I expect them to make the playoffs right away. This team does look like it should make the playoffs in the East at least. But as I said, the, the East as a whole did get better. Um, and so I think that these, these three guys not exactly, I mean, the coach, Lloyd Pierce, might be on a, on a hot seat, but Trey and Collins, I think that, you know, the, the attention will shift to them because we now need to see, will they be able to lead this team? Will they, able, will they be able to, you know, be the cornerstone guys on a team that will make the playoffs finally? Because we have yet to see them actually sniff the playoffs. Now it's time to see, can you guys get over that hump, make the playoffs, and what kind of experience can you get there? What kind of noise can you make once you make the playoffs and so on and so forth so I think that will be an interesting storyline 
And then finally, you get your first look at Clint Capella on this team as well, because I believe he was hurt last season once he was dealt to Atlanta, and we didn't really get to see him work much with Trey and the team. So um, that's another thing to watch for. I think that, you know, them adding Clint Capella was a big move in and of itself, and we'll see what happens there. So the projected standings that I have that I think is going to happen with the Southeast I'm going Miami Heat in first, Wizards in second, Hawks in third, Magic in fourth, Hornets in fifth. Yes, I have the Magic dropping two spots. I think, I mean, last year Wizards only had Beal. Beal got hurt. They had a bunch of just, you know, younger guys running around doing a lot of things, not doing very well. But now you add Westbrook, Beal comes back. I think that automatically shoots them up, especially in the division standings. Hawks added a bunch. I think that that puts them up in the third. Magic still looking for a lot of stuff to do. They could even make a deal for Vucevic. We don't know. We'll have to see what exactly happens there. Um, And then the Hornets, still young, still looking for, you know, uh, their identity right now, and they're still looking to improve, so have them down at fifth. All right, so let's get into the Central Division preview here. So last year's standings for the Central Division, we have the Milwaukee Bucks in first, the Pacers in second, the Bulls in third, the Pistons in fourth, and the Cavs in fifth. Um, Only a half game separated the Cavs and Pistons between fourth and fifth, obviously with the season season that got cut short. Um, Things like that could happen last year that usually don't. But... Let's start things off with the Milwaukee Bucks. They were 56 and 17 last year. They only lost five games at home. They only lost one game in the division. In the conference, they only lost seven games. So they obviously dominated the East. Giannis, MVP. I mean, it was all like very easy to, very easy to say. Um, then. This year, this offseason, they got a little bit better, to be honest. They drafted Jordan Nwora and Sam Merrill. They acquired Drew Holiday, Bobby Portis, DJ Augustine, Tory Craig, Nick Stauskas, and Bryn Forbes. They did lose Bledsoe, George Hill, uh, Matthews, Robin Lopez, Corver, Ilyasova, Sterling Brown, Cam Reynolds, Frank Mason III, and Marvin Williams. Out of those that they lost, the most notable probably being Bledsoe and Hill. Um, But their acquisition in Drew Holiday kind of overshadows everything. That gives them, I think, a much better shot at making a deeper playoff run. I was never much of a Bledsoe fan. I didn't think Bledsoe was a kind of championship point guard that you would want on your team. And I think Drew Holiday, especially with his two-way abilities, gives you something that Bledsoe never did. And Drew Holiday will end up being, you know, one of their saving graces, probably in a few different playoff games. Um, They signed Giannis to the Supermax, which is a huge win, not only for Milwaukee, but for small market teams everywhere. He stays true to his word. He wants to stay with Milwaukee and really bring them you know, a title there. They showed the trust in him, so he's giving that back to them. And now we can finally quell all of those things, saying Giannis to Toronto, Giannis to Miami, Giannis to the Golden State Warriors, Giannis here, Giannis there. He's still in Milwaukee for now. Um, Potentially for the next four or five years, we don't know what's going to happen within there. Obviously, something could change, and he might want out in that time period. But as of right now, he is a buck. Now, this team may have had the deal fall through for Bogdan, but while they looked like surefire East favorites with Bogdan, they still look like top two even like I'm talking come Eastern Conference Finals, they still look like they would probably go up against, uh, you know, Kyrie and Kevin Durant in Brooklyn for the Eastern Conference Finals. However, there's just a little, I guess there's not as much insurance now. So 
while it would have been better that way, they're still looking really good. They're still looking pretty well off. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this team still primed to, you know, be the number one, number two seed in the East. And I think it's going to really with this team, it just comes down to will they continue that in the postseason, not just the regular season. So moving on to the Indiana Pacers, they were 45 and 28 last season. Um, not bad, not bad at all. Uh, they're still an odd, albeit playoff team, not a championship contender. They don't really have a star on this team. I guess the biggest star is either between Oladipo or Sabonis. Um, Sabonis came out, was a great for them last season. Oladipo did get hurt, and then he was apparently asking teams in the bubble if he could come play with them. He's since disputed it, but at the same time, I feel like there's probably some truth to that, uh, whether it be the fact, you know, whether the, the wrong part might be the fact that he asked in front of his teammates. I feel like he probably still might have asked. <laughs> um, they drafted Cassius Stanley, which I think, you know, could be a decent selection for them uh they do need some wings here uh, after tj warren and oladipo it gets down to jeremy lamb and justin holiday so there's a lot of room to upgrade there um they acquired jalen lequeux keelan martin amita brima and rayshon hammonds i don't know if either four of them are even going to get much playing time lequeux was pretty much down in the g league most of last season for phoenix and if you're in the G League for Phoenix, I feel like that kind of says a lot because they do need guard help there, especially the last couple seasons. Uber athletic player, though, that could definitely bring some excitement to the team. Um, they still return their starting five in Malcolm Brogdon, Oladipo, TJ Warren, Sabonis, and Miles Turner. There was a lot of rumors going back and forth of them maybe trading Turner since him and Sabonis weren't exactly playing to the best of both of their capabilities together on the floor. Um, they still have, uh, in terms of their backups, Aaron Holiday, Justin Holiday, Doug McDermott, um, Goga Batadzdi, uh, TJ McConnell, you know, a lot of those guys, they bring in Jer Jeremy Lamb. Uh, so this team's still really odd. I think that, uh, you know, they only lost TJ Leaf and Elise Johnson. TJ Leaf hasn't really turned out to be anything. Elise Johnson, a uh, decent defensive player, but still not really a championship team. Still not really much to talk about with this team because there really hasn't been many big moves made. Um, they did get a new coach, but other than that, it's kind of like, I don't think the coach is going to make this team a championship team. There's going, There has to be at least one or two stars added to this team to really make it a championship contender. So moving on to the Chicago Bulls, they're loading up with a new coach and young talent. Their new coach, Billy Donovan, should be great for the young guys. I think that Billy Donovan will really unlock the potential of a lot of these guys. And... Um, as far as the preseason goes right now, it looks that, you know, a, a good bit of them look really good so far. And I think that, you know, they're really only going to continue to get better. Um, they did draft Patrick Williams with their first pick. And then they got Marco Simonovic, Simonovic, Simonovic. Um, Patrick Williams at first was a very odd pick in where they were at with who else was on the board. However, Patrick Williams is looking like something that they do need. I mean, he is in like, he's kind of that forward area that it could go like small forward, power forward, but also play some center um, in that area. They have Laurie Markin in right now, who also has been a little injury prone. So they're trying, I feel like they're trying to hedge their bet on Laurie Markin in and have this guy back there, almost like the Eagles that had Jalen Hurts and, and Carson Wentz, you know, just have that guy there just in case. Um, so we'll see kind of what happens with that. They're, uh, a lot of their young guys still returning and still looking um, to have a lot of potential. The one guy who doesn't really factor in as much to any of their plans is Denzel Valentine. I feel like they gave him enough chances. He didn't really make the best of those chances or opportunities. And now it's kind of like, okay, let's move on and see what else we got with this team. The starting five, most likely looking to be Kobe White, Zach Levine, Otto Porter, Laurie Markkinen, and Wendell Carter Jr. Um, 
not a bad starting five in terms of youth and potential. I feel like uh, uh, anyone on this team, if they were to be moved during the season, it probably would be Otto Porter just because he doesn't exactly fit the timeline of the rest of these guys. Maybe Zach Levine as well, but I feel like they're going to hang on to Zach Levine to see what else they can get uh, to go around him in the meantime. Um, the only people they lost were Shaquille Harrison and Max Struess, uh, two guys that really didn't even play for them much anyway. But I think the big chunk of potential for this team that they have to look at outside of Patrick Williams that they just drafted is going to be Kobe White, Zach Levine, Laurie Markkinen, and Wendell Carter Jr. Um, that's going to be a big question mark to see like how exactly fast this rebuild will be for the Bulls or not if those four guys can show more and more, <clears throat> excuse me, more and more growth, more and more potential. Um, and I think that if you could move Otto Porter for maybe like another first round pick or, you know, like another younger guy that has some potential, I think that that would be a good move for Chicago during the season as well. Moving on to Detroit. I can never really get a handle on Detroit or what the hell they're doing. They're making some weird moves. They made some decent moves too, but they're making some weird ones. I thought their draft was actually decent. They drafted Killian Hayes, Sadiq Bey, Isaiah Stewart, and Saban Lee. And then they added Jeremy Grant, Rodney Magruder, Musa, Jaleel Okafor, Mason Plumley, and Delone Wright. Out of those, I mean, I like the Jeremy Grant and Delone Wright additions, but I feel like the money they signed Jeremy Grant for, he should be a little bit better better than what he is for that type of money obviously he might be able to get there but with the current team I feel like it doesn't make much sense um Delone Wright solid though I like that they lost Jordan Bone Bruce Brown Jr. Langston Galloway John Henson Luke Kennard Brandon Knight Thon Maker Jordan McRae Tony Snell Walton Jr. and Christian Wood the most notable of those being Christian Wood the guy who really has grown tremendously since his first season with the Sixers um uh, they it just do doesn't make much sense to me that they let Christian Wood walk to Houston but then went and got Jeremy Grant Julio Okafor and Mason Plumley. it that whole thing is just a very big head scratcher to me and I don't exactly understand what the direction of that sequence of moves was. Um like you sign a bunch of big men but lost the quality one that was there for you the entire time and that you probably could have signed I mean probably around the same money and you kind of already know what you're getting, a guy that's still growing and everything that, you know, could grow more with the team. But hey, I guess they have some sort of plan, maybe, maybe, maybe I don't know. The big thing to me, I think, is what are they going to do with Blake Griffin? Because there's no way Blake Griffin fits the timeline of this team. They're not going to be competing for a playoff spot, really. I think it's kind of long gone by now to expect Blake Griffin to return to his prime ways of when he was on the Clippers. So I think this is a guy you need to move. However, there's not a lot of people that are going to want to trade anything of value for him because of his injury issues and because he is not back into his prime or even really, you know, doing everything he, he used to be able to do. And on top of that, like I said, the direction of this team isn't exactly clear and it's kind of confusing what they are trying to go for with this, but I guess we'll find out. Then, finally, we have the Cavs, who are moving under the radar, but still have a lot to build. They drafted Isaac Okoro, they added Thon Maker, they lost Tristan Thompson and Ante Zizic, so I think the added outweighs the lost there. Their starting five is looking pretty decent for the future with Darius Garland, Colin Sexton, Isaac Okoro, and Andre Drummond. And then even, I mean, their, Kevin Porter Jr. could also be a starter in there. Also, C.D. Oseman. Um, Kevin Love right now is a starter, but I feel like that's a guy they're going to try and move uh, the moment they find enough value for him during the season. 
the growth of the guys of Sexton, Garland, and Porter, though, I think will be the biggest things to watch for. What kind of steps are they making or leaps are they making this year? Um, how Isaac Okoro fits into this roster with them. And, of course, Andre Drummond does look, I mean, it's so far, he looks in good shape. He looks like he's refocused, re-energized, re-motivated. And it looks like he's ready to really compete for, you know, the respect that he thinks he deserves again. Um, they do have backup, like decent backups in terms of Dante Exum, Matthew Delvadova still there. Larry Nance Jr. is there as well. They brought in JaVale McGee. So they have some decent backups in there as well. And they also still have young guys like Dean Wade, Matt Mooney, and Dylan Windler. Uh, we'll have to see if those guys can actually vault themselves into the rotation because these are guys that we really only saw in G League most of the time. So there's a lot of growth still happening in Cleveland and a lot of stuff still to watch in terms of that as well. So my division prediction for the Central is the Bucks in first again, the Pacers in second again, but the Bulls moving up to third, the Cavs moving to fourth, and the Pistons down in fifth. Sorry, Detroit fans. And now, the piece de resistance. We move on to the Atlantic Division. Last year's standings. Toronto in first, Celtics in second, Sixers in third, Nets in fourth, Knicks in fifth. Everyone but the Knicks made the playoffs. Even without Kyrie and Kevin Durant for the Nets. So, the Atlantic Division was looking pretty good in the East. And we'll start off with the Raptors. So they're still looking for a new star or even a free agent star, but they're still a very high quality team, as we saw last season. Good coaching, good culture, uh, guys that really listen to everything and, and have grown together, good young budding stars and everything really meshing together well, obviously equates to a good team. They drafted Malachi Flynn and Jalen Harris. They added Watanabe, Elise Johnson, Alex Len, Aaron Baines, and DeAndre Bembry. They lost Abaka, Marc Gasol, Ronda Hallis Jefferson, Dewan Hernandez, and Malcolm Miller. Now, this is one team that I think the added and lost are either pretty close to even or a little more on the negative side. Just because Abaka looked revitalized last year and was had like one of his best seasons. Marc Gasol was a big time defensive player for this team that also still gave them the stretch five ability. And let's not also forget that Marc Gasol is a big reason why Toronto could really beat Philly a lot because Marc Gasol locked down Joel Embiid all the time. Embiid was like afraid of Marcus Hall almost. Marcus Hall was like the quintessential Embiid stopper, especially since at the time the Sixers had Al Horford on the team, who was the other Embiid stopper. So um, that'll be something to look for when they face the Sixers big time. They did re-sign Fred Van Vliet, which is a big win for their future. They still have Lowry around. They re-sign Boucher, still on the team as a backup big. One of the things that I think is going to be the most important for the Raptors this year and the, one of the biggest storylines to look for is going to be the growth of Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi. Um, I think that OG really needs to step up and become the true third option of this team. We saw a lot of good games out of him in the bubble. We saw him with like a game-winning shot. We saw him with some 20-point games in there. I think that that needs to become a consistent thing for the Raptors to take another step and to be able to um, really be ready, to, if they do get a start, to win another championship. Uh, now that Giannis has re-signed in Milwaukee. They have to figure out who that next star is going to be if it's not someone that takes a next step on their team as it is. Pascal Siakam, another one. He did improve a lot of his stats last year, but he also still, we need to see that be efficient as well, not just growing stats because of a ridiculously high volume of shots and, and usage that he's taking. Um, 
So uh, that's another one to look for. I think both are very good candidates to take another step, especially OG and Anobi. And though that'll be two big storylines to watch for. On top of, let's see what Fred Fred Van Vliet does now that he has now that he got his money. Is he going to be complacent? Is he going to keep competing uh, at the highest level like he is like he has been? What is going to come of that now that he got his contract? Now, the Boston Celtics, I think, so far are looking around the same as last year. They drafted Aaron Neesmith, Peyton Pritchard, Jan Madar. They added Tristan Thompson and Jeff Teague, but they lost Hayward, Cantor, Poirier, and Wanamaker. Um, losing Hayward and Cantor, I don't think, are humongous hits to the team. Uh, Hayward, while give, he gave them you know, a quality fifth starter and a quality wing, I think that, you know, he really wasn't doing all that much. There were some times that he contributed defensively. He contributed here and there all around at different spots, but was was never really back to his, you know, old self that they originally got in the first place. So I don't think that's a huge hit. Drafting Neesmith was big for them because they definitely needed the shooting coming off the bench. Drafting Pritchard as well, I think, gives them a solid, uh, well, I don't want to say a solid backup backup point guard because I feel like that's that's not something you exactly look for. <laughs> I to be honest, I was a little iffy about this pick in the first place. Somebody compared him to Jalen Brunson, which I think that could be a decent comp, but we'll see exactly. You got to wait and see for that one because Brunson has has really played himself into a role that is useful for Dallas, um, but. Now, with Kemba still nursing some knee issues, I think that that does become important, so we'll have to see what Pritchard turns out to be. Um, So that was an interesting pick, but it's a wait-and-see kind of thing. We'll have to see how Pritchard actually does come season time. Kemba, as I said, still having knee issues, so that is going to be a big thing to watch for. If he continues to have these, these nagging knee issues the whole season, I don't think this team goes anywhere as far as they did because Kemba was a big part of the offense. Yes, Tatum and Brown are still the de facto, you know, uh, one-two punch on this team. But if you don't have Kemba and your main two point guards after that are um, Jeff Teague and Pritchard with Marcus Smart, I mean, doing a lot in there at shooting guard and point guard and small forward, I don't think that takes you as far as you went last season. Um, Tatum and Brown, like I said, still looking like the real deal. Number one, number two punch. The, I think that one of the big storylines aside from Kemba's knee issues is going to be the play from the bigs and the bench squad. Um, you really have to see like now that they brought interest in Thompson, they still have Daniel Tice, uh, still have taco fall. So there's, I think that, you know, one of the big question marks with this team that has been a question mark for a lot of the recent seasons is their play from the center power forward spot. And I think that's going to continue to be a storyline and something going to be very important, especially the storyline with the bench squad uh, with Kemba going to be hurt. So you got to figure that out. Um, In their preseason game against the Sixers, Tatum and Brown looked good. Uh, Pritchard had a little bit of decent moments. Um, Teague, like, wasn't missing, so, I mean, that looked good. But overall, the team pretty much looked the same. And if they stayed the same and others got better, that means they're going to drop. So that's really what that's looking like. So moving on to the Sixers. They're looking fresh and new right now. Doc Rivers coming in, new coach, new system, um, new voice in the locker room. They drafted Tyrese Maxey, Isaiah Joe, Paul Reed. They added Seth Curry, Danny Green, Dwight Howard, Terrence Ferguson, Justin Anderson, and Tony Bradley. And they lost Horford, Richardson, Zaire Smith, Burks, Glenn Robinson III, Howell Neto, Norvell Pell, Mariel Shayok, and Kyle O'Quinn. Definitely added a lot more talent than they lost. If we're being honest, out of the guys they lost, the only ones that are were really giving any kind of minutes were Horford, Richardson, and Burks. Neto here and there. 
But even then, Horford and Richardson were just not a good fit with this team. The team needed shooters. The team needed people who could also play on the other side of the ball. Richardson gave you the defensive side, but very sporadically gave you the offensive side. Horford just never turned out to be what they thought he was going to be. Um, And the rest of those guys didn't really do anything. They now finally part with Zaire Smith, who they got in a trade for Mikhail Bridges. Obviously, trade looking pretty dumb. Zaire Smith still has barely even touched the NBA floor with a lot of the injuries and the really scary um, allergic reaction he had. So, I mean, best wishes to Zaire Smith, definitely someone I got to see play a lot when I was taking pictures at the Blue Coats, as well as Pell and Shyok, too. Um, definitely some good guys there. We'll see how they end up panning out. But they added shooters in Seth Curry, Danny Green. They added backup big man in Dwight Howard. Even a backup backup big man in Tony Bradley. Terrence Ferguson, give you some athleticism off the bench. Uh... Now you have a backup point guard, too. Well, I should say like a third-string point guard, too, in, in Maxi. Also, depending how well he, he uh, you know, how well he does in this first season. Uh, shooter in Isaiah Joe. Paul Reed, a stretch four that, you know, they're probably going to be more G League play than NBA play. So we'll see what he does. Um, so you added a lot of what this team needs around Ben Simmons. The one of the storylines I think is going to be watching these core guys in Doc's system, watching Simmons, Embiid, Tobias in Doc's system is going to be something to look for. We have seen Tobias thrive in that system before. We have yet to see Ben Simmons and Embiid in another system other than Brett Brown's. And I don't exactly know what that system was. It was just something <laughs> um so it's going to be very interesting to see them another one is that Embiid seems refocused as well he seems as motivated as ever he he looked to be lighter on his feet in the first preseason game moving around very well not lumbering whatsoever like he was last season um it looks like he's having fun again um and another thing is going to be Simmons growth is Simmons going to grow to what everyone wants him to be is he going to shoot more is he going to be the electrifying you know more point scoring more assist pl- kind of player uh like what is going to happen with Ben Simmons in that first game he looked like the usual Ben Simmons from last season I don't know if that's good or bad right now but it just looked like normal Ben Simmons um so we'll have to see from there the other thing is are we going to get a next step from Shake Milton, Furkan Korkmaz, and Matisse Thibel? Thibel didn't really look good in that preseason game. Shake Milton looked very good in that preseason game. Korkmaz looked decent. He was actually finishing some and ones. He looked like he put on a little bit of muscle. He was looking decent. Um, so Thibel, I think, becomes the big question mark, especially after a guy like Maxi looked pretty good. Uh, like, what is Thibel going to give you now? Is he going to be the premier defensive wing that he looked like he was going to be? Is he going to give you a little bit more than that on offense? What's going to happen with Matisse? I think that's a huge thing to look for with this team. Overall, though, I think the team will end up doing better than last season just because there's new motivation. There's new energy. It's a breath of fresh air now with this team is what it looks like. So we'll have to see what happens. Um, Now, on to the Brooklyn Nets. They're looking as scary as ever, which is expected. I mean, we knew once Kyrie and Kevin Durant come back that the team is going to look very scary. They both did very well in their first preseason game. Um, Draft-wise, they drafted Reggie Perry. I don't think that's going to really mean as much in the long run. They added Jeff Green, Bruce Brown, and Landry Shamet. They lost Garrett Temple, Justin Anderson, Wilson Chandler, Lance Thomas, Dante Hall, Jamal Crawford, and Zanin Musa. I don't really think it mattered much who they lost or added, but the the addition of Landry Shamet is big because now you have two big-time shooters in Landry and Joe Harris. Them, along with Kevin Durant and Kyrie, 
along with Jared Allen. <coughs> Excuse me. Along with Karis LeVert, Spencer Dinwiddie. That's a scary team. I mean, honestly, I don't think I don't need, I don't even need to say much more about this team. The storyline I think to look for is the growth from Lavert, Dinwiddie, and Jared Allen. The bench squad is going to need to step up big time because we know the starting squad is going to give you plenty of points. Defense will be something to look for too. We got to see what the defense is looking like because we know Kyrie is not known for his defense. Durant stepped up his defense in Golden State. Jared Allen, a decent defender. Uh, Karis Lavert, okay defender. So we'll have to see what the defense is like. I mean, obviously, if you outscore the other team, even without defense, then the defense isn't really going to matter as much. But, hey, teams got better. You're going to have to score a lot of points. So, And then, finally, we have the Knicks. They continue to build. They actually had a good offseason this offseason. They drafted Obi Toppin and Emmanuel Quickly, quickly. Added Austin Rivers, Alec Burks, Nerlens Noel. They lost Portis, Gibson, Ellington, Harkless, Dotson, and Hicks. The draft, I thought they did very well. Obi Toppin, I think, will be a solid player for them. Quickly, I think, could definitely grow for them as well. Um, I like the additions of Rivers, Burks, and Noel. Uh, a bunch of guys that will contribute quality minutes and some and and some of them that you know been in the league a little bit they could help out with some of these young guys you know just a veteran presence in general um but there's a few things to look for i think for the knicks one of them is being will kevin knox be a bust or not he did not have a good rookie season he had a worse sophomore season so now is that trend going to continue or is something going to change with Knox if they add some more people that kind of open up the court for him? Um, personally, when they first drafted Knox, I didn't think it was the right pick for them. So I don't want to say he's going to be a bust, but I don't think he's going to turn out to be anything of value for the Knicks. And once that happens, you can't really trade him away because no one's going to want to want that in terms of like a guy who's been um, regressing each season from his rookie year and it's only like three, four years into his career. So that's not going to look good. We have to see what kind of season Knox can kind of muster up here to see if he's going to be knocked out of the league or not. RJ Barrett needs to show improved shooting from the floor on all levels. His three-point shooting was horrendous. His field goal percentage in general was horrendous. Um, there's a lot he still has to prove. A lot of people are just saying like he's de facto number one, like the the best guy on the team. But Barrett still has a ton of stuff he needs to prove. Uh, prove. Zion, his teammate in college, doing a lot better than him, which I mean was kind of expected. But still, Barrett has a lot to show. Will he have a sophomore slump? Will he actually get back to shooting what they need him to shoot? That's that's going to be something to look for. And then two other things are they still need to find a point guard. I mean, they have a few on the roster. Alfred Payton doesn't look like their point guard. Um, Nita Lakina, I feel like at this point, probably is, you know, ruled out as their point guard moving forward after they start to finally try to compete. Um, Austin Rivers will probably fill the point guard roles for now. Um, and then they have Dennis Smith Jr. who just, I think is just trying to do way too much. I think he's trying to do a lot of what he did his rookie season. And when they figured him out after his rookie season, it kind of all went downhill. So now it's just, uh, all downhill. <laughs> Um, and the last one, it's Mitchell Robinson's time to shine for the starting lineup. I've seen depth charts that say Nerlens Noel is going to start. I think that would be dumb in the Knicks case. You should definitely have Mitchell Robinson starting, especially with, you know, how efficient he has been last season. And this is the guy you drafted. This is a guy that, you know, this is going to be a guy that, you know, might end up being the diamond in the rough kind of player for, for the Knicks. And I think if you're the Knicks, that's big for you because, Finally, you can say like, hey, look at the guys we've drafted. They've ended up being really good. And that kind of gets your um, reputation up first off. And second off, it gets you a starting center. 
which you definitely need (laughs) because it's been a long time since you've had a quality starting center, probably since like Amari Stoudemire or, or I guess was Tyson Chandler decent on the team back then. I don't know. One of those guys probably. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of storylines looking for the Knicks. At least they had a good off season. One of their first good off seasons in a while, to be honest with you. So I think that there's a lot of things to look for for them as well. So now the final division prediction for the Atlantic. I have the Nets in first, the Sixers in second, the Celtics in third, the Raptors in fourth, and the Knicks in fifth. Now, even though I put the Raptors in fourth, the Nets were in fourth last year at 35 and 37. The, all, all these teams can definitely be way over 500 and still be, you know, there. I think that these teams are going to be very close this season. And it's only going to be like a few games that split a lot of them. So overall... Even though I have the the Raptors down in fourth, I still think they're going to do very well. But overall in the East, I think what I have is the Bucks in first. I have the Bucks in first, the Nets in second, and then the I think I have the Heat in third. And then the Sixers in fourth, the Celtics in fifth, the Raptors in sixth, the Pacers in seventh, and the Wizards in eighth. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your Eastern Conference preview. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, make sure you check out basketballsocietyonline.com. A lot of new content, NBA, WNBA, college, women's college, everything going up there all the time. Make sure you check that out. Make sure you follow all of us on Twitter, Instagram. Um, I'm at underscore underscore fish for Twitter, at that kid fish for Instagram, and fish is F I S C H. Basketball Society underscore is our Instagram. BB Society underscore is our Twitter. Make sure you check those out as well. Also check out the Underdog Sports Podcast Network. A lot of great sports podcasts on there. So make sure you check them out as well. And as always, guys, thank you for listening to The Atlantic Files, the number one podcast on the number one division in the NBA. Thank you guys for listening, and I'll catch you guys next week. Peace.